second part of looking at population ecology, we're going to look at ways that we represent populations and try and figure out their size and determine if they're growing, declining, remaining the same. So one way that is commonly used, especially for humans, is a um, age pyramid or population pyramid. So these age structure graphs determine the amount of individuals at a certain age group and gender. So these are very age specific and gender specific. If you notice these pyramids have like males on the left, females on the right. And what we see when we group these by, in, these human populations by age, is we can determine if we'll expect to see the population continue to grow or if the population is going to start to decline. And we can tell that because we recognize that not all age and stage groups of humans are going to be in their reproductive years. So if we get a heavy top period pyramid, then we're going to see decline in that population. If we get a heavy bottom and middle of that pyramid, then we're going to be seeing more growth because those have the reproductive potential in the future, which we've talked about already. So the next thing we look at and scientists use requires a lot of math. The next few slides and sections really get math heavy. But what I'm going to try and do is kind of reduce that math. We need to be able to read these tables, recognize trends in them. But I'm not going to be asking you to do a lot of calculations. There will be some. So a life table is just a data table. It's just a data table that is specifically looking at stage and age-specific mortality. How old were they when they died? How many died at that age, right? Creating this life table takes a lot of studying of the population and the individuals. We need to know how many are reproducing, when they're reproducing, how many they're having each time they reproduce, how many survive, and how old are they when they die, uh, and why are they dying. So there's a lot of data that goes into the creation of life tables. And this data takes years to kind of come together, unless you're studying a, a short-lived population like an insect. Uh, most of these organisms live for a longer period of time, so it takes time to collect this data. And we calculate it all and put it into a table, which is what's here on this slide. So you can see we have recognized various ages and we have tried to determine both by both gender how many are present, how long, what their death rate is, the calculation, right? And so this is of particularly looking at a ground squirrel uh, that they were trying to study in Nevada. The next feature we look at is if this data can create a graph trend, right? And in that graph trend, one thing we look at is survivorship type. So you see a human there in our type one survivorship. That's pretty typical of humans, elephants, organisms that put a lot of care into their young very early on and for a very long time. So survivorship there is strong in the early middle part of their life. And then we see that rapid decline at the end. The next one is that type 2 survivorship. In a type 2 survivorship, we get constant mortality. Death is basically independent of age, which is depicted here with squirrels. The third type of survivorship that we look at is where we have very few surviving to adulthood. And these organisms tend to be organisms that put very little energy and energy resources into having young. They have a lot of them, but the success of those young are extremely limited. So those are our three types of survivorship graphs that we often determine by looking at life tables. So we've kind of tried to generalize what life tables can fit into by calling them low mortality, independent of mortality, and um, high mortality of young. This next slide that I accidentally just skipped past, 
as soon as I move myself out of the way, is survivorship strategies that we've seen. So we have type one and the type three survivorships. That type two, again, that was kind of independent of age. So that one's a harder one to study. In so when we look at these survivorship strategies, we exclude that type two. Um, what we've tried to do is determine connectivity between the type and characteristics, such as the kind of uh, reproductive strategy, growth curve that they tend to exhibit, logistic, okay, versus R or exponential, right? So logistic growths tend to level out. They're also called J curves. Those exponentials are the rapid growths, okay? We look at when they're having young, early in life versus later in life. So this table is really good at just trying to give you a summary of what we've recognized um, and trends and patterns that we've seen in type one strategy versus type three strategies. And type twos are somewhere in the middle. So here are those um, exponential or R or uh, logistic K growth curves. So we need to recognize them as they appear differently in different resources that our exponential growth is also known as our R okay? and our logistic or restricted growths or our growths with carrying capacities have been seen as a um, S curve or a K uh, strategist. And these organisms are naturally already reaching their carrying capacity and they kind of teeter around it. Deer populations in South Jersey, right? Whereas organisms that might reproduce very quickly like mosquitoes in a puddle or a pool of water on the ground have to have very um, high growth rates, fast growth rates, and uh, they can experience crashes afterwards. So those are our J-shaped curve and our S-shaped curve, which we don't usually use too often Usually you're going to see more of our um, R for exponential and our K for logistic growth. So the biotic potential of a population is looking at their age structure and their life tables. And it's trying to determine that maximum reproductive capacity for a population if we had limiting factors. And that's the key feature because most populations are going to experience some limiting factors. So we can only reach that biotic potential, right, if we have extremely favorable conditions. If everybody within that reproductive age group has all of the resources they need, then they can reproduce. So things that are going to influence that biotic potential, that maximum life capacity, are if we have a lot of organisms in that reproductive age, or maybe not so many. It's going to be based on the time that the species is reproductive. How long can they reproduce and create offspring? And how many offspring can they have in that period? So those are features that we look at when we talk about an organism has high biotic potential, then there's a lot of the population in the reproductive age. They reproduce for a very long time in their life, and they can have a lot of offspring. If we don't have deaths to offset the births, then what we get is exponential growth, right? We get this J-shaped curve, this rapid growth. And that's how I help remember rapid growth is exponential growth. And we tend to call this R growth, okay? is that rapid growth in time. If we don't experience deaths, we get this curve. So that should make sense, and that's exponential. Um, this is going to be our ideal conditions, plenty of food, water, shelter, right? We're meeting those needs. And we can also see this when we move organisms in, into a new area. That gr graph or tr that, that you tend to see is actually a trend line that's created. And in this case, this is looking at exponential growth over many years of a population of wolves. So we're looking at the number of pups born and how that is increasing over time, mostly because we had started protecting them in this example. So graphs 
like these J-shaped curves, these exponential growth graphs, um, are created and determined using, obviously, math calculations. So there's some terms we need to know. And those are things, uh, these letters representing different things, like the R being the growth rate. It's a constant. It's a value that would be supplied to you. Okay. We have N being the number of individuals, T time. And that D is also represented as a triangle at times. It's delta, which means change in. So there's actually subtraction going on in the top and the bottom of this equation. There's the change in the number of individuals, and there's the change in time that would then determine the number of individuals times that growth rate that that population experiences. So we would read this equation as the change in the number of individuals as time changes equals a constant r times the number of individuals. And that is the equation that we use for a exponential growth graph. So now you're seeing this math applied. And what I'm going to do from here is I actually am going to give you another um, video that comes off of YouTube because I, I found they used a stylus and they wrote on their screen. And they, they just did things that I felt like made a lot more sense to show you the process of using this math. So I'm going to wrap up and end here in showing you those applications of using the equation because we do use them to determine what the population will look like in the future or like what it was in the past. And we also manipulate that formula to determine those future trends. So again, I'm gonna give you another video on those now in just a moment. But this last one just talks about what conditions lead to population growth. And I think they should make a lot of sense. So I figured I'd cover this one. When we're looking at, there's no shortage of food, cover space, right? There's plenty of space. Disease-free, they lack predators. They have a high birth rate. They um, are really only limited by how many birth they can have. You know, do they tend to have one young, two young, four young, six young? If they had six, they'd probably all survive. That would be in ideal conditions. And if their death rates are not that high and they're not having a lot of their older age population die off, then they're going to stay around and be in the population count. And we get this when we move something new into an area. Okay, when they don't have competitors, that's a big problem with an invasive species. They have no natural predator and we just moved them in and they just flourish and capitalize and take over. Uh, we also see this with organisms that have very quick growth rates and bacteria, yeast, fruit flies, mice. So carrying capacity kind of ends off that limiting the population. Obviously, unlimited is that J-shaped curve. That S-shaped curve includes those limits which do occur in a population, and they're naturally supposed to be there. Food is going to limit a population. How much space, water availability in a dry season versus a wet, um, temperature and their ability to maintain themselves in that temperature and find food in varying seasons, their reproductive abilities, okay? their fighting for mates can kill off organisms. So there's lots of factors that end up limiting or creating a carrying capacity to a population. And those are things that um, need to exist or we would be overrun by certain organisms. So here is our logistics growth and, or our S-shaped curve, and also known as RK, for carrying capacity graph, right? applied with some density terms and more equations that we'll look at in the next video. So I wanted you to see some of the math applied, understand the difference between exponential and logarithmic. Obviously, our logarithmic graphs or our logistic growth curves still include some of that exponential growth, but then they experience the leveling off. Okay, and that's where we're going.